Now, my next guest is a bit special. He has a rare skill. Not only is he an international lawyer and author, he can predict the future. Not with a crystal ball or tea leaves or tarot cards, but with a microscopic attention to historical detail, previous trends and how they inevitably shape what is to come. There's even a name for this dark art. It's called Futurology. And I'm delighted to say that futurologist and author of the best-selling book, ironically titled The Book of Failure, Andrew Eborn. Hi, Andrew. Mark, it's a delight to see you again. How are you doing? I'm really pleased to see you. Uh, let me wave your book at the camera. Um, here it is. Faye, give me that shot. Look at that. It's a, a quality, quality read. I had a look in advance of our interview. And this book, it's called the book of failure, but this is to help people achieve success. Tell me more. Absolutely. We, we always shine a spotlight on success, but very rarely the failures that led to that success. So what I wanted to do was exactly that. Look at the moments in history where people have failed and failed spectacularly and what we can learn as a result of that. And we covered everything from politics to products to uh, uh, services and also the way that the media reports those things because there's a pattern and that's why we talk about, as a futurologist, how you can predict the future. You look at patterns in history. Because people always say that history repeats itself, and the reason it repeats itself is because we never learn the lessons from history. Well, tell me about some of the great historic mistakes, or, or, or whether it's companies or individuals that have, have seen failure before they saw success. I mean, give me an example or two. Well, we've got a number in uh, the book that we talk about. I mean, if you take a food product, for example, uh, the very famous Colgate, uh, famous for their um, wonderful toothpaste and various other uh, products that you might have in the bathroom, they dabbled briefly with food products. And there was a, a wonderful thing about a Colgate lasagna. Um, oh, and so, exactly, oh, crumbs. And so the association between the um, fresh breath and tingling gums and so on and so forth and, uh, and food products wasn't quite right. Um, we also had uh, the, uh, the wonderful thing, which was terribly sexist at the time, which was all about uh, the ladies' Doritos. Uh, and they, they suddenly thought that Doritos were too crunchy for women and women couldn't handle the crunch and therefore they would produce a product for women which wasn't quite so crunchy. Uh, there was famously uh, the Bic Biro, which I think is one of the great inventions of the 20th century. They had, I think, a, a product called Bic for her. Exactly. <laughs> that, that crushed and burned as well, didn't uh, it? So it was all glittery and, and pink and terribly sexist and that sort of stuff. But a massive mistake. But people sort of look at those sort of things. They also, Gerber's had um, a ridiculous product called Gerber's Singles where basically for people who couldn't uh, be able to cook for themselves, there was like this liquidized slush uh, in a can. It's rather like baby food. And it sort of rubs it in with its name that you can't go out and get a date or you can't go and see your friends or you don't have any friends. So you sit at home eating this uh, baby food. So Gerber Singles is uh, a bit of a nightmare. Uh, but whether it's Henry Ford, Steve Jobs, Richard Branson, James Dyson, we only think about their glorious success, but all of these people will have been schooled in failure. Oh, absolutely. And some of the, the best of them all, I mean, Steve Jobs, were classically thrown out of his own company, you know, until he was brought back with his little MP3 player and revolutionised <laughs> the way that we consume media. And he changed the look. And I always say as well, what we do at GB News here, you know, if it ain't yeah. broke, break it. Let, <laughs> let's be a disruptor in the market. Yes. And Steve Jobs was a classic example of one of the great disruptors. And he would do that rather than having those little black grey headphones that used to have with the wires. Mm. He would make sure you could see it. So you'd be yeah. gloriously white and no out. instruction manual, no instruction manual. Well, nobody reads them anyway. You can have thousands of different languages. And who reads the instruction manual? You want to get on and just do it. And are these people fearless? And is that key to us being successful? Because we're going to get to futurology shortly. But this book is very much there to inspire people to have success in life and, and, and maybe to get out of the rut that they might be in. Uh, have we got to be fearless and should we embrace failure then? Have we got to change our attitude to failure? I think uh, without a doubt it's all about an attitude change. We're so clear in this country and, and indeed around the world that we're always looking about failure and blame. And we're trying to not necessarily look at those as successes, but let's, how do we blame? Who do we blame for whatever mistake it happens to be? Mm. What I say is that if necessity is the mother of invention, then failure is the father of success. And so what you need to look at, let's embrace those failures because why, each failure is one step closer to success. And you always hear, don't you, about billionaires that make their fortune and then they lose it and then they make it all over again. 
Uh, and I believe that Donald Trump is an example of that. Oh, he's a, a perfect example. He's, of that. I think he has he been bankrupted at least once in his life. Uh, at least once, I understand. Yes, and, and he he will convert. <laughs> his but lawyers he, are watching. His lawyers, my God, they're always watching. They're watching. Well, can I just say you're rocking a bit of a Donald Trump? Well, I have to say, look, the ties. Look, yeah. I thought this would be the prediction. You see, futurologists, the ties that match our eyes is what they say. Can I just <laughs> say you you look you look like the sort of the after photo if you're being compared to Donald oh, Trump? Oh, is that right? Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, definitely. Uh, is that a good? Is that younger, a good look? Younger, slimmed down, far more handsome. Uh, you you always say the best things. Mark. It's always an absolute delight. Um, no, but what I do, and actually this is what happens, Donald Trump, and the reason I wore the red tie, because I knew you would wear your red tie as well, it's a power thing. And politicians will tell you, uh, and various other people, they do it for a particular reason. And the people who wear the, the black suit and the white thing and the, and the red tie, it means you're focusing on what they're saying. And it's been shown um, cosmetically and also clinically that it's far more powerful and people listen to what you're saying if you wear a red tie. I didn't know that. And, and you knew. You are a futurologist. You predicted I would wear a red tie. I knew you'd do it just for me, Mark. It was always a thrill. Well, now, this is really spooky because I've been presenting this show for about four weeks now. And this is only the second time I've worn a red tie. There you go. But we last time we met, and it is interesting, and there, there are all these sort of patterns of behaviour. We met on a different channel um, uh, a number of, uh, uh, not so many weeks ago. Yeah. But it was actually during Purda. On May the 6th, we were being yes. filmed. At the same time, May the 6th, we were being filmed. A certain Matt Hancock was also being filmed <laughs> um, on that particular I've date. I've seen the movie. You've seen that. I think a few people have seen the movie. But for me, what's really interesting, this is what I say about history, is that people don't dig deep enough into the questions. So that Matt Hancock encounter with Gina was filmed on the 6th of May, same time you and I were on the air together. It wasn't until the 26th of June that that story came out. So when people start talking about, oh, it's scandalous and everything else, there are so many questions that the media should have asked at the time. How on earth did a camera footage from a minister's office yes. get onto the desk of the sun? Why wasn't that the first question? Of course, it's all scandalous and everything else. Why was there that six-week delay? Yes. And you look at that and how we're being manipulated by the media. And it's only 10 years since the Leveson report about the media and about the phone hacking press and all that intrusion. sort of stuff. Press and, uh, and working on that sort of basis. So to what extent the whole debate about privacy seems to be sidelined a little bit. Now, I know that people have started to do various inquiries now into how that footage uh, got on the desk of The Sun. But for me, um, looking at it as a, as a journalist, as you yourself, we sort of turn around and say, we need to ask those questions. Who, what, why, when, how are certain things doing? It's like the famous interviews, you know, um, when anybody can go on to Oprah or whatever and they can say all sorts of terrible things and if they were true, they are indeed terrible things. But as an interview, you would turn around and say, well, let's ask a bit more mm. because you want to know, because they are terribly damning and the effects of generalised statements could be massive implications for people. So I think as a journalist, you do need to, you owe it to people to say, well, okay, well, when did it happen? Let's put it into context. What was the context of a particular statement? It's not saying it didn't happen. It's just saying, let's look at it. So I would urge everybody to question everything. Yes. And when you're looking at history, that's what people have failed to do. They don't question what's happening. Well, speaking of which, the pandemic, and, you know, I won't drag you into the rights and wrongs of lockdown. I know it's, a, you know, a very sort of, uh, it's a very challenging debate to have, and, and people are very quite tribal and territorial about whether they're pro or anti-lockdown. But I just wonder whether you see this assault on civil liberties and the growing sort of iron fist of the state and authoritarianism is something that we definitely haven't learnt from history in relation oh, to. Without a doubt. I mean, the father of PR, Bernays, he said that the best way to sell anything to people is fear. Mm. Because fear spreads more than anything. And so what happens, it's not the first time in history that we've had a pandemic. We've had pandemics so many times throughout history, only as recently as 1918. Uh, there was a worldwide pandemic which infected 500 million people. It was wrongly called the Spanish flu. It actually started in Kansas in February 1918. It, we had episodes in the UK, there were episodes in France and Germany. But the reason it was called the Spanish flu is there were restrictions on journalists reporting things in France, Germany Sounds and England. Familiar. I know, because of the war. We were coming out of the war and there were various uh, uh, restrictions and embargoes and so on and so forth. But Spain didn't have such restrictions. So poor old King uh, Alfonso XIII uh, contracted this flu. 
Uh, and it was widely reported, King Alfonso. And every day you'd read in the papers, this is an update on King Alfonso. So everybody wrongly labelled it the Spanish flu. And so you talk about the misrepresentation uh, throughout history. It's one of the corrections. I know lots of people in Spain would be delighted to have that correction. It should no longer be referred to as the Spanish flu. If anything, it's the Kansas cough. That's where it started. And would you take the same view of things like communism or hard left economic models that because it's been a while since there was a sort of well-publicised failure, suddenly voices from the left get strong again? Because, you know, I live in fear of the idea of, you know, pure, undiluted socialism, because I, I feel I experienced the tail end of it in the late 1970s and early 80s, especially kind of in, in local authorities. And, you know, I was just of that era, the late 70s, when we had the winter of discontent and labour isn't working, sky-high inflation and unemployment. So I feel mentally scarred by the sort of socialist economic model. But... Um, is it just human nature that if enough time passes, we forget and make the same mistakes again? I, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, people want to forget. They don't want to remember the bad things. So we don't learn those lessons. But also there's a cycle. And the way that people work about things, we talk about the news and the way that media respond to certain things. And people always say that if you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. And if you read the mu newspapers, you're misinformed. Mm. And the reality <laughs> is this, is that people go to their own prejudices. You'll watch a particular news station that will confirm your views. It's great that GB News airs many, many views. Let's talk about diversity. Let's get people speaking about everything. Yeah. But a lot of people will go to a channel, one particular channel, which will always just give the same view, which happens to coincide with their own view. They will also surround themselves with friends in social media who share those same views. And all you're doing, now read a newspaper that confirms those views. All you're doing now is confirming your own prejudices. And as a result of that, there will never be a change. And if I could urge anything for people to do, it is question everything. Surround yourself with different views, because then you can make an informed decision rather than just peddling uh, the misinformation. And expose yourself to discomfort. Yeah, absolutely. And, and views that you might find unpalatable. And it, it's interesting, because when I prepare for this show, I couldn't do it without the mail and the telegraph, but I also couldn't do it without the mirror and the guardian. Yeah. And I'm grateful that all of those publications exist. And similarly online, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, I mean, all of these places are, I mean, yes, they're very partisan, they're, each of them in their own way is an echo chamber. But as you say, if you've got a plurality of opinions around you, then that's where progress lies. Oh, absolutely. And it's understanding and actually respecting opinions. Because so many people, as soon as you've got a contrary view, they sort of switch off. So unless you can analyse somebody else's opinion, and that's actually how you persuade people to do something for the future, how to change. And of course, a politician that's only surrounded by yes men and yes women, or indeed uh, an entrepreneur, will be less successful because they're not receiving the truth from people. Oh, absolutely. It's rather like, oh, it's the very British way of saying, well, how are you? Well, I'm fine. You could be <laughs> yeah. had the worst day ever. Uh, and, uh, and you work on that sort of, sort of, sort of principle. But I think the, you have to. It's like an actor or a comedian coming off stage, which you'll be doing shortly, coming to uh, real yeah. live gigs coming back. But they always want to know, well, how was I? And they always got told, oh, you were wonderful. Mm. But actually, the benefit would be to share a bit of honesty, to say, actually, this is what you could do better in a private moment. Yeah. Uh, and it's by that that you progress things. So I would always like to surround myself with uh, different opinions, like to surround yourself with actually people who say no. Because by saying no, it forces you to analyse what you're doing so that you can do it right the next time. So you're a futurologist. How can others predict the future? My viewers, how can you help them? How can you equip them with the tools with which to see what's coming? Well, I think it's looking at those patterns. So I gave yeah. the example, for example. So does that mean knowing about history? Uh, part of it's knowing about history, but it's also knowing how people report history. Because hmm. history is only one person's view of a particular situation. So, and we famously know you were taught at school, well, this is the, the view of a particular war and uh, the people who lost that war will report it very differently. Uh, you often see that. We see, uh, I was interviewing Charles Spencer uh, fairly recently. We Diana's got, uh, brother. Diana's brother. Uh, going back in history and looking at that sort of side about how things have been misreported and those seismic moments in history that get misrepresented. And there's a problem with certain programmes, which are combinations, if you like, brilliant programmes. They are fantastic. Like something like The Crown, for example. It's a great programme, but it blurs the line between a documentary and a work of fantasy. Mm. 
And the problem is, by doing that, you're missing and misleading the public. And he was, he publicly said, he was very upset that some of his relatives were wrongly portrayed. And you work on that sort of basis that actually if it were a fair representation, because people's family are still alive, then they won't view it as a work of fact. It is, in fact, a, a glorified drama in some places. Now, I'm going to once again tell my viewers about your book and I want to hear about the talk show. But what is going to happen next? You are a futurologist. Can you give us a ballpark sort of overview of what we can expect in the sort of months and years to come, you know, post-pandemic uh, is the economy going to be OK? Do you think we're through the worst of the pandemic? What, what, what are your thoughts about what's to come here in the UK? Can, okay. can my viewers be optimistic or should I they worry? I think your should be very optimistic. But really? Pre but prepared. You have to readjust. I think that, that's the key. There's going to be a big readjustment. If you look at history, I talked about the 1918 flu. It, it went on until uh, it started in February 1918. It went all the way on to April uh, in 1920, mm. there were four waves of it. Yeah, 500 million, million so people are affected. A year and a half, two years, Absolute, which is the natural trajectory natural, of a viral pandemic. Absolutely, but it was followed, Mark, by the Roaring Twenties. Mm. And so there was a moment of optimism. We are so desperate to get out. I was talking about gigs coming back. Yeah. And all that sort of entertainment. I know you're doing one in a few weeks' time, Pre which is brilliant. Yeah, Premier League, of course. Absolutely. Full stadium now. All that, and it's brilliant. And it's brilliant. I've been going to lots of theatres now. They're open. I'm seeing everything. Because there's a real hunger for that. But there's also that element I spoke about earlier, which is fear. And we need to make sure that people are not scared of doing things. A lot of the cinemas are open at the moment, but I, I was there today. And what most of the see? places... I saw a number of things. Actually. Today I saw, uh, what was it? Um, uh, Tom Cruise, uh, Mission Impossible. That would be good. It was Mission Impossible. I mean, it was the, the guy. Was it Free Guy? What's he called? Um, oh, OK. You, you know, the is one it? which is... It, it's the similar one to um, many years ago. They used to have uh, uh, Hidden in This World. You know, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of a science fiction-y type it, thing. It was. And you're in a computer game, which is great. I love that. I love yeah. that so, as a principle. So, but uh, you're saying that we've got to just, yeah, overcome the fear now. Yes. Get on with our lives. And do you think the economy is going to be all right? I think it, the economy is going to be good. Global in certain, economic crash? In certain sectors. And that's the key. I think for, uh, if you look at a lot of the problems in the world, like climate and so on and so mm. forth, if you look at some of the solutions to those, I think there's some great investment opportunities. Mm. I also think... So you don't of, think it's all going to... The, 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 the entire sort of Western economy is going to come crashing down? I think there's going to be a readjustment, all right. and that will be followed by a period of growth. Okay. And there are certain sectors to have a look at that sort of side. Mm. So look at the different sectors. Look at how technologies advanced as a result of the pandemic. How we've uh, got new vocabulary, if you like. Zoom. Who heard of Zoom yeah. uh, um, a few months so ago? Thought that was a nice lolly, didn't yeah, you? Well, I did. I mean, I used to enjoy those. So yeah. embrace it and adapt and be positive and I, I, it's going to be I, all right. But also understand it's about education. Because a lot of people, if people, people when, when they're scared, they just bury their heads in the sand. Yes. So actually go and find out, because not everything's OK. Yeah. It's not a glossy picture. Mm. You have to be prepared. And so have a look at what the real opportunities are, because there are great opportunities, but there are also lots of risks. Mm. And look about that great readjustment so you can be prepared for that situation. OK. Um, you are a very successful broadcaster, so how can people see your talk show? Well, all, all over the place. More platforms than Paddington is what we say. That's but, very good. Are, uh, you, are you on YouTube? That's where one of your channels is. Yeah, so it? we're on YouTube, but we also get specially commissioned for various shows. So, for example, uh, I was in China, uh, albeit uh, virtually, for MIP China, which is really? one of the, the biggest TV markets over there. I was interviewing, they wanted, uh, of all the big Western stars, um, interestingly, their top choice was a chap called John Stevenson who was the director of a movie called Kung Fu Panda. Oh, yes. You remember Kung Fu classic. Panda? It was a classic. That's more million. my level. That's more your sort of level. Yeah. No, but it was 600 million at the box office. The reason they, he was such a big star in China is it took a Chinese story, uh, which was done by a Western company, uh, yes. and they made a success of it. So they wanted So I interviewed John uh, and looked at the DNA of a global hit. Um, so we looked at that sort of side. But we also looked at technology. I'm employed by um, Sony and various other markets around the world to look at their new technology advances. So we're looking at 8K, for example. We're looking at the, ad, uh, the advent of artificial intelligence and how that's being used uh, to, oh, to help in, in, in create... Well, content. it's been it's been an education. Uh, you will find Andrew's work on YouTube and, as he said, across every single platform. And his book is out now. Andrew Eborn's... There we go. Still getting the hang of this. It's called Book of Failure. And Andrew, what a privilege it's been to have it's you in the studio. To see you Thank again. you so much for joining us. And we'll get him back in six months' time to find out what he predicted actually happened.